delighted to have you all here with us. Thank you so much for being with us. It's, uh, we are ready to start. There's never been a better time to have a virtual lecture and to get together online. I'm Rachel Michalik, co-owner and principal of Curie Art Group. We make art that matters by creating stories and using emerging talent and putting them into the public eye. We work with brands such as MGM, Marriott International, Four Seasons, and Starbucks, to name a few. We are so excited to talk about this fascinating topic of photo as an object. Uh, if you have questions throughout, please feel free to type them into the chat box. We will address all of them at the end. And now I'm gonna pass to my lovely business partner, Brooke, to introduce tonight's speaker. Hi, everyone. My name is Brooke Nelson, and I'm the other co-owner of Curate Art Group. And I met Douglas years ago while working at Bergamont Station in Santa Monica, which is a collective of galleries in Los Angeles. And um, while Douglas really specializes in working with collectors, I transitioned more into artwork for hotels and corporations. And we've been friends for years. We love sending each other artists and designers that we are excited about. And I just have loved learning from him over the years. And to further give you a bit more information about Doug, he was born in Texas and he studied photography at UT. And after directing and organizing over 50 art shows and fairs, he decided to open up Marshall Contemporary in 2018. His gallery focuses on process-based photographers. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Doug to share more. All right, thanks for that lovely intro. Everyone, audio is okay? Um, so yeah, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Uh, Brooke and Rachel reached out to me a couple of weeks ago about this, uh, doing a, a, a live sort of lecture talk. And, you know, my first thought was, was, you know, what I talk about to all my friends all the time, which is what I refer to as process-based photography. Um, going back quickly, um, I had been working in galleries in Santa Monica and other parts of LA for several years, um, working in more traditional photography spaces, you know, classical photographs in, in the sense that the majority of us uh, think about it. And through that time, I, I, I'm still really fond of, of traditional photography, classical, classical, especially black and white photography. Um, but towards the, the latter part of my, my last gallery job around 2017, I started becoming aware of international artists really focusing more on um, what I would refer to as process-based photography, meaning the process of how it's constructed, how it's built is of equal or sometimes more importance um, than the image that the photograph contains or that the artwork contains. And so it's something I'm, I'm quite fond of. And in 2018, started Marshall Contemporary, which is a private um, art gallery here in LA. And I do some independent curating, doing group shows and things with other organizations. So I'm gonna go through about a 15 or 20 minute slideshow um, showing a few artists who I think are making interesting headway into this genre um, in the contemporary practice. This is by no means a, a comprehensive overview of the field right now. These are just a few artists um, who've got who are sort of making really interesting investigations into physical photography, process-based photography. So I'm gonna switch over to our slideshow here if I can uh, pull it off successfully. Hopefully that's going okay for everybody can see this on your screens. Someone give me a thumbs down. Thank you for the thumbs up, even better. Thanks, Krista. So, um, the agenda here, I'll just kind of touch on these briefly and we'll, we'll sort of circle back to these. Um, but I will talk a little bit about where this, this interest started for me, how I got obsessed with the idea of, of the photograph being an object. Um, several artists who are working in um, these methods that I, create, I think create a feeling of authenticity um, and how um, the physicality and texture of these objects I see as sort of a pushback against the, what I sometimes call the Instagramization of photography. Um, how, it, how it plays into the market and additions versus singular work, say like a painting being a singular work, is of interest to this genre, and, um, and a few closing remarks followed by Q&A. 
Uh, so before we get started, I believe we have a, a little audience poll for you just to kind of gauge where everyone's mind is at before we go further into it. So what is a photograph? Do you see it as something as a representation of real life or an image that's created by a camera? Yeah, I think everyone's kind of on the same page. I think um, there are a lot of you know, answers to this question. And I think the more we, we see, the more fluid it can be. Okay. So the majority of us feel that, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, different answers of what this could be. And I'm going to try and push that narrative that, you know, a, a photograph is something really fluid See if I can do this here. So this image is from a 2015 exhibition at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. This exhibition was called Light Paper and Process Reinventing Photography. It was curated by Virginia Heckert, one of the head curators of photography at the Getty Museum. This exhibition brought together seven American artists who were uh, investigating what the, the curator Virginia referred to as the material essence of analog photography. So essentially investigating the photochemical capabilities of the photographic process, light sensitivity, and unique ways to, to manifest a physical object through photochemistry. Hey, hey Doug, I think we uh, only see the first page. Uh, the first page of the slideshow? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me, maybe if I exit out of it here for a second. Oh, Are you perfect. St still seeing my screen? Yes, we see the right side now. Thank you so much. Let's see. Good? Uh, nothing. Go back? Okay. Oh. No worries. Perfect. Does that work? Okay. So the full screen, as I expected, had a little complications. So can you, you're seeing the Getty exhibition now. So as I was saying, this exhibition featured seven American artists who were experimenting with uh, the material capabilities of the photographic medium. I really liked Leah Ullman, who's a writer who contributes to the LA Times. She called the exhibition an inventive subversion of photography. And for me, this was a really sort of light bulb exhibition to see as I had been consumed in the world of um, classical photography, especially early 20th century black and white photography, and really thinking more about the image, I really wasn't giving much thought to the physicality of the object of the photograph. And this exhibition really highlighted that. So for me, in 2015, seeing this exhibition was a really sort of um, an, an awakening for me to investigate the physicality of the photograph. Two artists that were featured prominently in it and are still exhibited widely after this exhibition were Alison Rossiter and Chris McCall. So Alison Rossiter is a great example, completely cameraless photography. She has the piece on the left here. These are four silver gelatin panels that are exposed by Rossiter uh, in dark green chemistry to reveal certain tones um, that are embedded in the paper. She works with expired dark room gelatin silver papers, some back to the early 20th century, some more recently. And depending on how they're stored, the quality of the original paper, all these different um, atmospheric conditions, the paper will in, uh, sort of have different tonalities that will come out of this. So completely cameraless, completely, completely imageless, um, but it becomes what, what I would call formalism or maybe photo formalism that we're really concerned mainly with the process and the forms that the process reveals. On the right, Chris McCaw is an artist based outside of the Bay Area, I think in the Carmel area. And he sort of became, rose to prominence through his Sunburn series in which he was um, putting large sheets of silver gelatin paper into the camera and photographing long exposures of the movement of the sun. And kind of like as a child, if you would burn leaves with a magnifying glass, the small aperture of the lens will burn through the paper as it, as it proceeds across the, the film plane. So these are paper negatives with the paper inside the camera. Um, so when you actually see the final piece, you're seeing a sort of ghostly image of the landscape and this, this physical burn. So of course, each piece is going to be unique and thus because of this, this burn into it, it has a texture, it has a dimensionality to it and really becomes a singular object. 
So this exhibition really got me thinking um, towards the end of my last gallery job before I started Marshall Contemporary that this is what I wanted to focus on these types of um, innovative experiments into the photographic world. And so as I started to build Marshall Contemporary and the idea of it, I started to seek out artists who were working in these methods. Uh, one of the first artists that, um, that joined me was the Spanish duo Alberon Cabrera. They're a Barcelona-based duo who are making small, intimate-sized prints. This is sort of a, um, not a full departure into the objectness, maybe as we saw Alison Rossiter, where it's completely imageless. Um, these are still made with a traditional camera in the beginning, but they are then exploring a lot of different layers, uh, combining multiple processes together. The, the image on the left is a series called Kairos, where they're investigating the sort of Eastern philosophy of, of investigating the present moment. And so they're combining uh, multiple images together into a, from a few moments apart into a single print. And the prints are rather small. They've got a really nice heavy weight to them. On the right side is a platinum palladium print, which is a really one of the earliest photographic processes, um, but printed onto Japanese gampy paper with a layer of gold leaf underneath it. So it has a sort of iridescence to it as you move around it. Again, for me, it's interesting to think that not only should you look at a photograph in this case, but I really encourage collectors that I work with to hold it. Um, because they have a, such a fantastic texture and weight to them. Another image from their Cairo series investigating the idea of the fleeting present moment. This is a cyanotype over platinum palladium. Again, two very vintage analog processes, um, but layering them together is a quite tricky thing to do. And then um, you're seeing a lot of different tonalities. So each print, even though they do make their work in, a, in small editions, each print has a, a unique tonality and, and texture to it. Now kind of taking it sort of more towards Alison Rossiter's view, this is Nikolai Ishuk, is a Russian artist based in London. This is our works from his series called Thresholds, where, where Alison Rossiter, as we saw earlier, was letting the chemistry really do all the talking. Nikolai is really using mathematics and different formulas that he is working with expired paper to determine the shapes and the curvature that he wants to expose in the paper. And because these are expired papers um, with varying qualities of chemicals in them, they will shift over time. They will start to kind of become darker or lighter as you move around them. So this is one in the same piece, but as you see it later or get at different angles, it has a, an illuminance to it. And I like this image on the right because this is sort of me at every art fair or exhibition getting really up close to the side of prints and wanting to see how they come off the wall. Um, so again, I think you want to question, is this still photography? At what point does a photograph become sculpture? Um, this is somewhere perhaps in between. It's completely photographic in its construction and its exposure and chemistry, um, but maybe not what the average person would think of as a photograph. One of the other photographers I work, for, work with is Jakob Tabor. I think he's maybe in our audience as well. He's based in Toronto, and while most of Jakob's work is what we would refer to maybe more as straight photography, a single image on paper, this piece, which he called the pre-myth from his series, Where Ravens Cry, which was about the mythologies of the First Nations around Vancouver Island, the landscapes in that area, he said was sort of a moment of realization for him, kind of as I talked about earlier, where he kind of freed himself from the idea that the image, the photograph has to be one piece in a frame, and instead he has included five photographs of the same location over a time um, as the fog is clearing on a lake and creating a really a more sculptural piece that then also brings the element of time into the photographic process. Krista, who I met recently um, doing portfolio reviews and is here with us, is doing a really fantastic series called Displacement. And I was sort of, had seen her work before we met recently and then seeing in person really gave me a better understanding of it. As you can see here, it's, it's a multi-layered process that starts with photographs and then is using a, a laser cutter to cut in the text of um, letters that she's investigating. I won't go too long on her concept. You can go see her work online and she's doing some, some studio videos right now that explain it. But really now you're seeing a purely what I call process-based photographic piece. It's photographic, it's how it starts and it's in its essence, um, but using the uh, laser cutting technology, the layering, it's really becoming a, a singular object that has a, a sculptural quality to it. So before I move on to the kind of next section, I think uh, we have another audience poll to kind of see how everyone's going and for me to 
take a drink of my beer to take a break for a second. So is rarity of work important to you as a collector for the collectors involved? I thought this was an interesting question because this is the question I asked myself. I think a lot of what drove the art market in, in the past was rarity that a collector valued a painting, an important painting, because it was one, it was unique, a one of a kind piece. And then with photography, I think one thing that has always held it back for a long period of time in the history of art was that people felt it could so easily be replicated and that that devalued it in some way. And I think we're seeing that change. And so for, yeah, it's an interesting, about a third of you do think it's an important thing and a, and a third, or two thirds of you don't. So I think that's an interesting result. So moving on, I wanted to um, jump into a few manifestations of the physical photographic process in contemporary landscape photography. Uh, this is a particularly strong area of interest for myself and I'm working on a few exhibitions uh, focusing in contemporary landscape. And it seems to be a place where uh, a lot of artists are working in these, these more physically process driven methods. Uh, Jung Jin Lee is a fantastic artist um, from Korea but based in New York City. And for many years, she's been, I think, two decades, she's been working on handmade um, Korean papers that she creates herself and then coating them with liquid light. Um, so not only, which is a, a emulsion that you can buy at a photographic store to really make anything light sensitive. Um, so not only does, do, do her, her pieces have a, a beautiful texture to them because of these, these sort of handmade mulberry papers, but they also, are embedded with a lot of brush strokes as she's applying the light sensitive chemistry herself. So now we're seeing something between a painting and a photograph. It is, I would still say a photograph as it's made of, of a photographic negative exposure, um, but because the construction of it, we're seeing something else where the photograph is becoming painting or sculpture. Now this is going even one step further. Matthew Brandt was an artist that was also featured in the Getty exhibition that I referenced at the beginning. Uh, is an artist who has done a lot of different series um, exploring the physicality of the photographic process and, and chemicals involved. Um, a standout series that I think um, gained a lot of attention for him and was featured in that exhibition was his Lakes and Reservoirs. And he was photographing um, lakes and reservoirs in um, chromogenic process, so a color chemical photograph with um, color pigments, and then processing or embedding the photographic print into the the water taken from that area. So using the location of the photograph in the physical creation of the photograph as, it, as we see it in the exhibition um, form at a later date as a, as a final piece. And so of course the water is full of all kinds of organic and impurities, organic matters and, and impurities that are going to distort the chemi chemicals in the photographic print as you can see here to quite an extent. Then going even a step further, now we're back to completely cameraless um, sort of attempts at, at imaginary landscapes. Liz Nielsen's an artist based in Brooklyn and like Matthew is working with chromogenic papers. So these are um, not your inkjet papers, but actual um, um, chemical photographic papers for color photography and working with them in the dark room, making photograms. So again, a cameraless process, just working with the paper in the dark room to create imagined forms and uh, in this case uh, the illusion of landscapes in her piece underwater mountains this is a quite large i think about uh, six foot wide print now does the nikolova kratzer another artist who's um, creating sort of fictional landscapes in her work that she's working with tin types um, but again working in the dark room cameraless and creating these compositions that for the longest time even me just seeing them on the internet before i met her in person I thought they were ten types of landscapes. They have these sort of what look like nighttime views of, of lakes or waterscapes and mountains in the desert, um, but are completely cameraless. And she's just working in the dark room, applying chemistry very uh, strategically to create this feeling of, of these landscapes. And these have a really excellent sort of luminous gloss to the to the ten type process. A couple more artists. Uh, Clea McKenna is an artist also based in the Bay Area. I think it's great that the Bay Area and Southern California as well is, uh, has a, a prevalence of artists working in these methods. The San Francisco area has long been, especially in the early 20th century, 
or even to the latter 19th century, back to Carlton Watkins, the Bay Area seems to be a hotbed for artists who are pushing the photographic medium in exciting directions. Clay McKenna is one I've watched for several years and also has several brilliant series exploring the physicality of the photograph. Here we're seeing a piece from her Generation series, which was exhibited at Von Lintel Gallery in Los Angeles, um, where she is taking textiles that have um, historical and significance, especially um, to women in different cultures throughout history that she's researched and acquired. She's then taking these textiles and running them with the darkroom silver gelatin paper through a printing press, which is embossing the texture to really find details of the um, textiles that she's found into the paper. Then she exposes the paper to light manually in a dark room, which reveals the texture that's been pressed into the paper. Uh, she's also working with some copper toning and different elements that, that bring sort of different hues and tonalities to the print. And of course, you can see all the cracking and um, sort of where the paper is then smashed in the printing press. So again, once more, we're seeing a, it's a photograph in its most chemical basic essence, um, but it's really pushing into the realm of sculpture. And one or two more artists, Adam Jefferson is, uh, I believe, a, a Dutch artist based in Argentina. Uh, I saw this work at Paris Photo last year, which is sort of the, the biggest event, international event for photography exhibitions. And I was really fascinated by his series Tanks, which are featuring a cyanotype, one of the early photographic processes on silk, which is suspended in mineral oil. I had to correct the slide before because I thought they were suspended in water, but in talking to his gallery, the mineral oil allows, uh, refracts the light differently and allows the uh, contents of his tank to, to bounce um, off the inside glass pieces. So it creates a real sort of strange feeling as you move around it and you don't always see straight through it. So here, there's a photographic element to it. The cyanotype is a photographic process, but the cyanotype that's suspended in the oil does not contain any image. It only contains the photo chemistry that created the color of it. So here I would say now photography, you know, it's almost hard to really call this photography anymore. It's really gone all the way into sculpture or maybe we shouldn't use these terms and just call all of them art and not think about is photography something separate from art. And, and just if, if the artist is working in creative methods and expanding their process, um, I think we can call it art. I think um, the sort of super curator, Hans Ulrich Obrist, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, uh, he had a quote um, that said, perhaps the best definition for art is that which expands the definition. And I've always really enjoyed that. So in closing, I just have one or two more slides and we'll get to some Q&A. Someone at a dinner recently asked me who I thought was the most, you know, the, the, the greatest working photographic artist. And at first I thought there's no way I can really answer that question. Um, and gave me about 30 more seconds and I thought Richard Leroy. And I would even step back and say, I wouldn't say the greatest working artist or, or the most profound, but for me seeing Richard Leroy's work at Pier 24 in San Francisco, which if you've ever been there, you know, if you haven't been, I can't recommend enough to visit Pier 24 whenever they reopen, as I'd say, it's the best space to see photography in the United States. And they have an amazing collection, which features quite a few large prints by Richard Leroy. Richard has created this massive camera that's about the size of a room that he uses to project light or project his image, these pieces from his studio directly onto ilfochrome paper, which is a now defunct process. But the result are these large life-size prints that, as I describe them, are the closest thing that I've ever seen to seeing real life on a two-dimensional surface. Now, this is kind of back to more, maybe a more traditional photograph as most people would think about it. But when you see them in person, and that's really the only way you can do it, there's only so much the computer screen can allow. Um, I think you have a profound experience looking at the photograph and seeing the way he's captured his subject and seeing the detail that is as much as the human eye can see is because the photograph is made directly onto paper without in any intermediary. There is no real resolution or pixelization. It's just pure light onto chemistry. So you're seeing as much detail as the human eye can see. And so for me, that was a real profound uh, experience in recent history. This is a 
image from his Pace Gallery exhibition just so you can see their, their scale. So in closing, um, I have this beautiful Sugimoto here, one of the really acclaimed Japanese photographer. This is a piece from his Lightning Field series where he was um, basically giving an electric shock to a dark room silver gelatin sheet of paper. Um, really gorgeous chemistry uh, used in this process in terms of the blacks are really jet, jet black and the paper has a really elegant texture. So, you know, kind of one of the classic uh, photographic quotes is if you don't like your, if you're not making good photographs, get closer. That was in the, the atmosphere of photojournalism, but I would encourage you next time you see an exhibition of photography, whenever that may be, hopefully pretty soon, is to really get closer, to look at it from the side, to look at it under raking light, and to really think not only about the image it contains, but the objectness of it and the physical construction that the artist has created. So anyways, in closing, I've got this big picture of my face, which is what we all want to see after all these beautiful artworks. But I'm here in LA. Um, I run Marshall Contemporary. Um, we right now, I run a uh, private space and doing in the past mostly art fairs and pop-ups, but we're looking for a physical space at the time here in LA, uh, hopefully opening in the fall. So this is kind of the world that I work in. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. And um, yeah, I just want to say a huge thanks to all of you. I hope this was something new and, and sort of makes you think about photography in a different way other than the gazillion that are made on Instagram every day. So a huge thanks to Brooke and uh, Rachel for having me. And I'm going to pass it on to Brooke to lead us in a little Q&A. So thanks. Thanks, Doug. That was awesome. Um, I especially love the the photographer that uses the lake water mm -hmm. into the photograph it's just that's so cool and it, yeah incorporating like where it was taken with the actual 2d piece it's really special yeah he's um, based here in la and just did a, a zoom talk the other day and is working with um observatories now doing documenting different uh, celestial events in this process so there's a lot more to see if you check out his work Great. So let's, uh, there's a, there might be a few questions. Um, where do you see um, the future of photography going? Um, and let me know, do, do we want to stay on the full screen or should we, we um, go to our views? I, I, I wanted to close this one thing and I'll come back to that question. Um, these are a few uh, monographs if anyone wants to check out that I would highly recommend. Um, if you email me or, or Broken Rachel later, we can send you this info as well. But these are three great books uh, as we can all use more books. They're not easy to find. They're mostly out of print. Uh, I do believe Arcana Books here in LA has a copy of each so you can call them but do support your bookstores because they're they're really hurting right now. So give them a call if you can. So uh, where do I see the future of photography? Uh, I'm going to stop the screen share. Is that all right for now? Um, the future of photography. I mean, it depends if you're talking about, you know, as we've seen, there's a lot of definitions of photography in terms of in the art world, um, which is, I think, the only thing I can speak to right now. Um, I do think we're going to see more of this physical. I think this, I, I had a section that I said, um, a, a new authenticity, I think, as we're seeing in all aspects of life, especially in these days, is people want to sort of the buy local trend. They want to see handmade. They want to buy furniture from someone in their neighborhood versus Ikea. You know, there's this, this longing for a pushback against the sort of digital diet we've had for the last couple decades. And so people are really wanting to see more physicality and texture and, and, their, and sort of um, you know, I talk a lot about uh, the, the Asian or, or Eastern philosophies on wabi-sabi and, and imperfection in objects. And so I think in an art context, you know, we will see more and more. And, and that has shown itself over the last five years, going to a lot of art fairs and museums, you see more and more of this type of work being, being shown. So in an in a art context, and, you know, I, I do want to say it doesn't mean that this is what I'm really interested in, but I do still think, you know, the photograph as an image is still an equally powerful medium of art, even if the, uh, I work with the talk, some photographers who they don't care at all about the paper that they're working on or the way it's framed. It is purely about the image. 
Um, and that has as much artistic integrity as anything we're talking about here. Awesome. Um, one more question. Um, what, what, uh, what would you say are the top photography shows each year around the world? Like top three? Well, I mean, this is going to be sort of a thing of nostalgia now because unfortunately I don't think we're going to see these shows anytime soon. Uh, the biggest ones in terms of fairs, um, you have fairs which are purely commercial events on a massive scale. Uh, Paris Photo, uh, which is every November, probably not this November, but we'll see. Um, the APAD photography show, which is in New York. Um, then there are a lot of uh, festivals, you know, all around the world. There's Arles in, in France in the summer, which unfortunately was just canceled. So it's, it's hard to say. I mean, all these are the biggest, uh, uh, you know, events, but I don't think you're going to have the chance to visit any of them, at least in any normal sense for the next year or so. We'll, we'll see. Of course, so much of that is up in the air. I do think like all of us, you know, those events are adapting. So one of the fairs I really love, which is in Paris, that runs during uh, Paris Photo is called Approche, which is a small a sort of salon type show of 14 galleries. And they've just announced that they're moving out of their sort of space where all the galleries were in one building and are going to be sort of in a district in the, in the Marais in Paris in a bunch of different galleries. So to be able to keep the crowd sizes contained. So I think we're going to see a lot of, of those large events sort of breaking into smaller scales, which I think is great. I mean, honestly, when you go to Paris photo on the weekend with 35,000 people, it's, it's completely insane. I mean, it's really, it had gotten out of control. And so I think we're going to see smaller and smaller spaces. That's why I can't recommend enough Pier 24 in San Francisco. Uh, it's a huge space, but they only allow 30 people per two hours. So it's quiet. You're in these rooms by yourself and you really get to engage with the art. So, uh, you know, Pier 24, New York, um, you know, Mocha always puts on great, great exhibitions of photography, of course, and SF MoMA, for sure, so. Excellent. Rachel yeah. and I always love going to photo fairs in uh, Fort Mason in San Francisco. It's one of yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, all right, um, I think else? this, I think there's one more, one more question would be good, and there's, I think this is actually a really good question um, from probably our youngest viewer here, Genevieve. Uh, she's asking, uh, what brought you to love this specific art form so much? Well, um, photography in general, I think I, like so many people, photographers talk about, I was watching a video with Christopher McCall, the artist I referenced earlier with the sunburn pieces, um, you know, that the magic of it, when the, the, the first time you develop a print in the darkroom, I, you know, really worry with a lot of universities and high schools closing their darkroom and going to digital only, um, you know, classes. It's not that I have a problem with digital photography. It's just, I think there's a magic to analog photography that if we lose that, we will also lose generations of uh, artists who want to use the photographic process. And I think it's the element of chance is probably the easiest way to, to phrase it, is it the element of chance that is involved in analog photography that you don't really know what you got until later? You don't get that immediate um, satisfaction. You have to kind of wait for satisfaction or disappointment, whichever it may be. Um, I think that's really in my early teenage years is what got me learning darkroom in, in early high school and starting to make photography. And then, you know, after university is when I sort of transitioned to um, being more of an exhibitor and curator than, than an artist myself. Um, but I think any student that's had that moment in the dark room, um, it kind of hooks them. So I would say that that's really, and, and that probably then leads back to how I became so obsessed with this, what we've been talking about today, the, the, the process-based uh, photography and the element of, of chance and accident that, that comes into play. Great. Question. Um, I guess we can uh, ask some more questions, but um, I, we don't want to take up anyone's time. Uh, Rachel, I'll leave if you're bored. Yeah, only, <laughs> only. Yeah, Rachel, well, do you? 
Yeah, well, there, uh, we got a few more questions in the chat. It's officially over, whoever needs to go, but um, these are really great questions. We have one, uh, one from Emma. I'll read it exactly. You kind of already answered this, but very interesting is how photography is viewed as being devalued because of its ability to be replicated and lack of rarity, especially with Instagram. So the question is, do you think that creating value with photography now requires going this extra mile and blurring that line between photography and an object? Do, do you have to create it to be an object? Well, in terms of like market success for an artist, there is no right answer. How one artist becomes famous and successful and another doesn't for better or worse uh, is there's really no, uh, I, I, no, I don't think they have to go into this way. I think it's easier to maybe get attention quickly, um, at least from galleries. If you are sort of, I don't think you have to go, you know, into uh, reach for, you know, some sort of obvious physicality in your printmaking, but I do think you have to be able to speak about why you print on whatever paper you print on, or this is something I talk to artists always about in portfolio reviews is why that paper, and, and a lot of times they just never even thought about it, and I think, you know, there, if you are trying to claim that your photographic process is art, then I think you are claiming that you're creating not always true, but creating an object. And so you need to think about the objectness of the art piece that you're creating. So, um, I mean, there are tons of photographers. I was just watching an interview with Alex Soth, who's completely image-based. There's, you know, he's not, I mean, I'm sure the papers are really beautiful and the prints are incredible, um, but there's not really a process aspect to it. It's, it's an image-based and, you know, hugely successful showing in major galleries uh, and getting major exhibitions and commanding major prices. Um, so I do, I think it's easier maybe to get the attention of galleries probably, but I don't think you have to go there. Um, one of the artists I work with, Judith, um, Stenikin, she is making beautiful, beautiful prints, but she's not thinking this way. She's not obsessing about papers or the way it's presented. She's, she's thinking more about the narrative of what she's doing and the, the conceptual approach combining video, uh, with her still photography. And so it's more about the image. Uh, and the combination of images. So um, I think the market, because that's exciting and new, people experimenting with photochemistry and also people's attention spans are shorter than ever, that it's easier to grab people with something that's textured and big and crazy looking. But um, I think you just always need to have a reason for doing it that is convincing and not just for wow factor. Great, thank you. Uh I think there's a couple other questions and then we'll pop off. Uh, do from James, James Cotelli, do most great photographers work exclusively in photography or do they work in other mediums as well? Well, I guess if they're referred to as a photographer, then, you know, they're probably working for the most part in photography. But, you know, again, I think if you look at somebody like Matthew Brandt, who we showed the, the lakes and reservoirs pieces, um, uh, you know, he's each each series he does is still has an element to photography, but it's always um, bringing in different materials. Um, and some are these enormous large panels of silver. And, and so I don't think, you know, he would call himself a photographer, he would just call himself an artist. And that's probably the case for most of the people working in this, um, in this process based photography. Uh, they, they wouldn't say I'm a photographer. They may use a camera in, in their art, but they're not a photographer in the sense of if you look at a photojournalist, you know, they are a photographer. They are intending to tell a story through still images. Um, so I think uh, when it gets into the, it's, it's a lot of it's about the intention of, of the person. If the intent is to make art, it doesn't matter what device there, whether it's a paintbrush or a camera or metal or whatever, um, then they would just call themselves an artist. So I think most of these artists do dabble in other processes and sometimes combine them within photography. Um, but I think the purely photographic photographer is, you know, going to be, if they refer to themselves that way, then that's probably what they are. But it's all about intent, I think. Great. 
And in closing, because this is a plug for you, someone asked if you have any virtual galleries and showrooms that we can check out during COVID at this time. I know you do some stuff on, on the weekend, so I'd love for you to share. Why, yes, I do. Um, yeah, no, uh, if you go to the marshallcontemporary.com website, we have two exhibitions of um, Jakob de Boer, who we showed his piece earlier and is here with us now. Um, this was a solo exhibition we were going to show um, at Paris Photo um, until it got canceled, and which is a really in-depth with a short film and a lot of installation views. And uh, we just launched one this past weekend with six artists, um, which is a which we call Solidarity, and is a, a group of artists who were willing to contribute pieces that we would donate a significant portion of the sales to the WHO's um, COVID-19 Solidarity Fund. So I'm hugely thankful to them for, for being willing to do that. So you can see those on marshallcontemporary.com. Uh, all of it's on Instagram. We'll be doing an artist talk this Saturday on Zoom as well, if you'd like to tune in for that. So yeah, we're all trying to figure out, um, of course, each of us in our lives is trying to figure out how to, to manage the current situation. But as gallerists, you know, we're sort of relying on the internet for a while, but I think even though it's been exciting the things we can do like this i think once we can all return to seeing art in person even and maybe even hopefully on a smaller scale and in more intimate settings uh is going to be a great thing because it is about the the social aspect of it is a big part of art for me well so. thank you so much doug you did a really great job we found that amazing you learned so much thank you so much for the audience for tuning in we have a lot to do. That was so much fun. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me, Brooke, or Doug. We're happy to send you this slide deck or any other resources.